Hey everybody, welcome to Hump Day Hangouts, episode number 99. We're quickly approaching the uh, triple digits here. Uh, today is the 28th of September, so sadly this is going to be the last Hump Day Hangout in September. But uh, we're going to keep rolling, and we got everybody here today, so I'm going to go down the list. How's it going, Chris? Just kidding, maybe he's not. Nope, Chris is muted. He was kidding. <laughs> he's just <laughs> muted. <laughs> he's unmuted. Now, Chris? Chris? No audio. <laughs> yeah, just kidding. We're just screwing with people, apparently. Okay, moving on down the line. Or not? how's it going? Hey, guys. What's up? It's really good to be here. I'm pretty sure Chris is, is thrilled to be here as well. So, yeah, I'm go. fucking thrilled now to be here. <laughs> ah, all right. Uh, Marco, what's the weather uh, down in Costa Rica, man? Very ashy. We had a, a, a seven, seven. We had a seventeen-hour eruption, man. Ash all mm -hmm. over the place. Jeez. So, other than that, beautiful weather, nice and warm, all day. Clouds are rolling in, so if I check out, you know what it is. I got hit by lightning. Gotcha. It's the it's the Google police coming and yeah, taking. Yeah, you. right. <laughs> They're behind the volcanoes. What's that? Google Team Six trying to keep me away from uh, revealing revealing all this all this secrets, right? Hey, Bradley, how's it going? Good, man. Happy to be here. It looks like we got a ton of questions, so we got to right. get through announcements fairly quickly. All right. Well, then, let's get started. The first one, we got an RYS announcement. Um, going to have a link for you here in a second, but uh, we've been trying to upgrade our systems. The RYS ordering, we realized, for customers wasn't maybe the best experience, um, and we wanted to offer um, a better experience. We're a little bit delayed on that. But we wanted to go ahead and get you guys um, the discount. So what we're going to do over the weekend, I believe until Monday morning, and Marco can correct me in a little bit if I'm wrong, but I think we're going to offer $97 um, off of any stack you want. And then over the weekend, if you make an order of three or four stacks, we're going to give you a 10% discount. And if you order five or more stacks, we're going to give you a 15% discount. Okay, and because our system isn't up yet, we're going to have to just refund that after the purchase, the, the 10 or 15% part. The $97 will be immediately taken off. Okay, and then in the new system, that's going to be immediate. So we'll have bulk pricing. So, you know, if you've got custom orders, stuff like that, you can put that in there and save it anymore. So I'll put that link up there in a second. Um, yeah, just, SERPs, yeah hang, on, hang on a second. Oh, just, go ahead. Sorry. Just to make that clear, you get $97 off and an additional 10 or 15%. So if you order bulk orders. Yeah. You have to order bulk, but you do get that on top of the 97 from each stack that you order, you get a, an additional 10%. So I think that's pretty cool. Can you yeah, define no, bulk? That's awesome. Uh, three or four orders and for 10% and then five or more for 15%. So if you order two, sorry. And moving forward, we're not going to offer this like where it's many days you have to order. It's going to have to be done either at once or however the system defines it. But for this weekend, you can get away with ha having several uh, days here where you can make that three order minimum to get the extra discount. So you're saying you can make one purchase at a time, uh, but combine them for the bulk discount by Monday, you mean? Correct, correct. So yeah, if you've got some uh, clients or something, uh, you know, or if you're doing this for yourself and you want to get some stuff together, realize this isn't something you usually just, you know, pop out right away. So got a few days here to do that. Um, real quick with SERP space, um, we've got a ton of new features coming out. We've been talking about it. The PBM domains are out. Hernan actually has uh, gotten some domains through there, so he's gotten some pretty good results. Uh, yeah, some re uh, go ahead. I, uh, if you yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, we had, I, I was telling the guys that I was pleasantly surprised about it because I had, and, and I'm not saying you're going to get the same I mean, I'm not saying you're going to get the same exact kind of domains, but you're going to get high quality domains. I ordered two domains and both of, both of them had links from Wikipedia, you know, and people are paying $500, $600 for these kind of domains. So go get them. Yeah, obviously, like Hernan said, this is your mileage may vary. We don't guarantee Wikipedia links, but yep. those were the ones he got and those were not handpicked for right. it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, press releases, we've been talking about it for a really long time. But They're going to be out. Yeah, Shh. press releases are going to be in surf space on Friday. Okay, so I don't know. I wish I had the special effects for like balloons and, and confetti, but uh, we're going to have that. And then uh, on early next week, you'll be able to do multiple. So right now you're just going to be able to order one. In the future, we're going to be able to do kind of a discount for bulk ordering. Um, and then I believe, Bradley, are you going to be doing some training on some of this? Yeah, I am eventually. Um, I'm going to be doing um, some training on 
best use best practices for using press releases and in what we're going to call PR stacking or press release stacking. Um, I'm going to be doing some training on that. In fact, there's going to be training. Part of that's going to be included in the Maps Kingpin training, which is the upgrade for local Kingpin, which launches at the end of next month. Um, but at the same time, we're going to end up having some training inside of SERP space so that people can see how to best use uh, press releases. All right. Well, that's about all I got. On the RYS sale, while we're here, is there anything, can you guys remind me, do people need to do anything on the form or is the $97 automatically taken off? They have to enter the, the coupon code. Yep. Okay. They need to. Mm -hmm. Which is, I will put that up there. I assume I know what it is. Thanks. All right. Okay. The last thing I think Marco had uh, wanted to talk about the patent, correct? Yeah, this is this is really interesting because I'm always looking for for ways to like put the, the puzzle together. The ranking score that I'm always talking about that Google's using to replace PageRank, and somebody shared a patent patent with me recently, and it it kind it, it just you know my mind goes off and, and I start going in a thousand different ways and trying to figure out because people know this this is a distance graph part of the algo, there's a trust rank part, this topical trust, this freshness, this seasonal, there's uniqueness, and there's artificial intelligence, among other things. And we try to hit those to stay away from the Google Dance sandbox and pen and penguin penalties, right? And doing all of this, we build our ranking score. But it, there's always missing information, and the way that, that, that you put this together is through Google Patents. And I missed this one because, interestingly enough, there's only one place on the patent where Google is mentioned. The rest is the, the what do you call it, the so-called inventors are mentioned, and, and they use Mountain View a lot rather than Google. So they're trying to, to avoid my filters, right? They're trying to, people have all, all of these filters looking for these patents, looking for these filings, because they have to tell you what it is that they're doing. So I guess they're trying to hide it as much as possible. So when I really got into it, what I realized was that it dealt directly with, with why IFTTT, SEO, and RYS Academy work so well. So not only do we trigger all of these other parts of the algo that, that we mentioned before, right, distance, trust, topical, trust, freshness, and everything else, but it, it, it actually talks about uh, um, site quality score. There, there's actually a way that they calculate the quality of the website. And the way that they do that is a person clicking on SERP results. But what, what's really important is, is that this has to do with brand plus keyword association. Because if, if we're dealing with artificial intelligence, right, it, 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 what we can infer is that the robot is learning. So if the robot is learning, we can teach it, correct? I mean, that, that, that's, anybody should be able to see that. If it's out there learning, we can teach it. And one of the ways that it learns is, is the site quality score. And what it does is it gets all of this information from uh, users on how they click on the SERPs, how they click on results, and then they follow the user to the website and see how the user reacts to the website, right, which is why the bounce is so important and everything else and, and everything else that they do on the website. But anyway, so they'll show a result, then they'll show an alternate result or another result if the user comes back and searches again. And this aggregates. There's an aggregate result, so it, it adds up. And this is why uh, websites like Facebook, Twitter, I don't know, Coca-Cola, choose whatever brand you want, Adidas. Why branding works so well? Because people learn to associate your brand with certain keywords, and so does the bot. If, if it's done enough and you get enough aggregate, then all of a sudden your, your brand becomes synonymous with, with these products or services or whatever. And that's what's fabulous about this, uh, this patent and what's fabulous about IFTTT SEO and RYS Academy because we're always telling people brand, 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 limit the way that, that you do exact match keywords. You can use uh, exact match anchors but we tell you to brand, 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 brand. And so this just goes on to, to verify what it is that we've been saying all along. 
the branding is, is what's coming. It, it, it's the future. And if you're not doing it, then you're missing the boat. So, and I want to add to that. I'm going to grab the screen here and add to this because we're going to get into questions anyways. But number one, um, Marco, can you drop the link to that patent on the event page? Uh, da, 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 da. You yeah, I'll have it. to dig it up. All right, that way the other people, uh, you know, all the viewers can go check it out if they want. Guys, whenever Marco drops a patent link, like it's Chinese to me. I can't I can't decipher that legalese crap. I just can't do it. So that's why I leave it to him. <laughs> but I'm going to go ahead and grab the screen real quick, guys. We're going to get into questions here in a minute. But I do want to add to what Marco just said, so bear with me one second while I get set up. Um, and then I'll zoom in on these pages as well. I know you guys sometimes can't see very good. And we've got a question also that shows up as spam for some reason. Oops, I don't want that. Excuse me for a second. And I'm going to have to answer that separately. All right, so here's what I wanted to show you guys real quick. You guys are seeing my full screen, correct? Yep. Somebody? Yep. Okay. All right, so we talked about this before, specifically with the crowd search training, guys. Um, if you are if you haven't seen that and you want to talk about, if like this, this speaks directly to that. And I covered this kind of without knowing that there was – uh, this other patent that Marco is talking about, <clears throat> there was another patent, a, a separate one, for, different and a separate and apart from what he's talking about, that um, talks about site weight. And site weight is a score. It's part of the quality score that Google will assign to a site. And a lot of it, you can influence site weight. So uh, let's put it this way. A site that weighs has more weight in Google's eyes than another site. What determines, what gives it more weight? Well, navigational searches do and to back up for a minute if we had two identical sites I know you know that's pretty much never gonna happen but if you had two similar sites similar you know the same industry for example they had similar amount of pages with about the same amount of content about optimize the same let's just say they were very similar sites but one site has a history of navigational type searches and the other site does not Okay, there's no search history with the brand name or the company name or the website name um, as part of the search queries. Then the one that does have the navigational searches is given more weight by Google. So all things being equal, on-site and off-site or on-page and off-page SEO, if, if all things were equal, and I know that's never going to happen, but if they were all equal hypothetically, the site that has more is given more weight, it's got a heavier weight in Google's eyes, is going to always outrank the other site. Okay, does that make sense? And what are navigational searches? Well, navigational searches are brand name searches, guys. And there's variations of that, like brand plus keyword, uh, or brand plus product, or brand plus service, brand plus contact, brand plus location. Okay, so those are all types of navigational searches. They're brand searches, and then you can add, add other elements to the query if you want. And so that's how you can actually influence a particular brand and give a site more weight. You can influence a, site, a site's weight, excuse me, by setting up spam, click-through spam. That's what I call like things like crowd search, guys. I call it CT spam, click-through spam, okay? And you can do that, and, that's, and it's been working for me ever since the moment, like in the crowd search training, if you guys want to go through the full training, you just go to Google, type in crowd search 2016 demo or crowd search demo 2016 or something like that. You'll see our webinar that we did um, in Google. Just click on that and you can watch the entire webinar where I go into this. But um, before that was even available, I used to do that with uh, micro task workers where I would hire micro task workers and pay them, you know, 10, 12, 15 cents per piece. And this is a, I want to give credit where it's due. This is a technique that I learned from Ivan Budimir. Um, way back when, I'm talking like 2012 time, guys, uh, where I would set up crowd search or excuse me, micro task workers to go search brand name searches and brand plus keyword and it would influence a site weight and I could see significant improvements in search positioning just based upon those. Well then an automated tool like crowd search came out and I've been using it ever since November of 2014 in this particular way and in that crowd search 2016 demo or whatever it is uh, I can't remember the title of it if you go watch that you'll see exactly how I have it set up and why it's so effective because I think CT spam used the way it has been advertised in the past which is keyword searches and click-throughs I think is a is is not is, is an improper way to use it and I think it's actually dangerous because it can flag your site 
for fake traffic or spam traffic. But if you're using navigational searches and you don't get crazy with it, you keep it within reason and you use navigational type search queries and force click through traffic or CT spam, like I call it, through to the site using brand terms, you can influence a site's weight. And that's going to give you a, 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 a benefit, you know, your site becomes heavier and it's given more priority over other sites that don't have as many navigational searches. And it's very, very effective, guys. And I've been using it, like I said, um, specifically within crowd search since November of 2014 and I still use it today. So hopefully that was insightful. This wasn't something really that we planned, but I thought we should uh, share that with you guys. So, okay. Anything else you want to add to that, Marco? No, no, that's, that's perfectly well. Now we know why. Very cool. I'm, I'm glad that like there's a second patent out there that kind of reinforces that, that first one. So, all right, let's, um, let's get into this. So the first question is going to go to Jay, and then the next question goes to the one that's been marked as spam. So we're going to have to switch screens here in just a moment. Jay says, I need the city-specific search volumes for some niche keywords. Now that Google Keyword Planner only shows range, what are the alternatives to get that kind of ballpark figure? Update came across this. Abbas has a solution in his video here. I can confirm it works. Creating a manager sub-account and G-account. In a, uh, a manager sub-account in a Google account apparently opens up specific search volumes for the manager. Yeah, so you set up an AdWords manager account, and then you connect a regular, manager, a regular AdWords account, I believe, and then you log into the Google Keyword Planner from the AdWords manager account, and it will open up or give you back the data. That's at least my understanding. I haven't had to worry about it only because I, I've, I always go in through my AdWords manager account, so I've never experienced not having the volume, uh, search volume data. Um, but I know a lot of people have had issues with that, so I think the, I th this, just click on the link here, guys, if you want to see it. I also found another resource. Let me open up. I'll share it with you guys real quick. Just give me a second. Got another resource I can share with you. Come on. Oh, there it is. Uh, let's see. Is this it? No, I'm sorry. I'm looking for it. I just added it in here earlier today. It was from um, Screaming Frog. Um, I'll have to find it and post it on later, guys. There's a, a pretty cool tutorial that actually goes in to... Um, I could have sworn I'd save that. Let's, let me check one more thing. Keyword. Enter. This is it right here. Okay, so this is from Screaming Frog. Uh, it's a great tool, guys. If you're doing a lot of client work or you have a lot of websites, uh, Screaming Frog is an excellent tool. <clears throat> but this is a great article where you can get way more granular keyword data as well. And so I'm going to share this with you guys on the events page, and you can check this out. This is a pretty useful article, I thought. So this is Keyword Planner Data. All right, back to questions. So yeah, thanks Jay for pointing out Ab's video. Um, that I, I believe that works as well. Also, is it still possible to create a Twitter feed via Google Apps? Seemingly, Twitter has changed the widget interface. Did not look possible. Uh, Marco, can you answer that one? Um, no, I can't because I haven't checked. Okay. Um, I know I, I wasn't sure if because of Twitter SEO Academy, other people were having issues um, creating that Twitter script. But there's this, guys. I'll, I'll post this as well. You can create a feed from this, and it's free uh, from Twitter. Um, it's called Query Feed, querryfeed.net. I'll post this on the events page as well. But as, as uh, last time I checked, it's been several months, but you could create a um, RSS feed using this from Twitter, and it works. So at least it did a few months ago, so <clears throat> check this as well. There you go. So two resources for you. So next, um, this would be Ben. Ben says, I am in a foreign country. If I am serving clients locally in foreign language, but I also have an English speaking, English speaking clients in the UK and Australia, what is the best way to structure my website in order to rank number one for SEO city name in both languages? Would it, would it be to have the English language site as SEO city name and the foreign language site is a subdomain like country.seo city name or have two separate sites. No, I would do it on a subdomain, absolutely, Ben. Because that way, any SEO work that you do to either site, either the subdomain site or the root site, will benefit 
the, the root domain as a, a, entirely. So I know domain authority metrics really don't mean shit anymore, um, but it, there, there's still some benefit to it. And so it, anything that gets done to the subdomain is going to benefit the domains as, as a whole, right? So, um, yeah, I, he wants me to copy and paste. You want me to paste it in where? Uh, Slack is fine wherever just, just so I can Slack? keep track of okay. it. Because, yeah, I think if I pasted it, it might come up as spam again on the event page. Um, I don't know why Ben's got flagged as spam. Maybe because of these links. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, I would absolutely use use a subdomain for that. Okay. Do you know of geolocation of the server the site is hosted on matters for ranking? It does slightly, Ben. But it, your, your follow-up question is, example, or uh, if my hosting is located in the U.S., will that make ranking in a foreign country more difficult? Okay, I don't do any foreign SEO stuff. I just never have, guys. I always just I've done everything in the U.S. But fr from my understanding, um, in the U.S., it makes a slight ranking difference to have, uh, but it's not. It's it's not. It's marginal, guys. It's not really worth. Like if you've got if you've got a site hosted on a server in the U.K. and you're in the U.S., you're trying to rank a site in the U.S. I wouldn't say go move your hosting account. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's a very small difference. Um, whereas if you, the server is located where your site is in the U S right, that it, it does help. But as far as I know, and I don't have any data to back this up other than just things that I've read on forums and stuff like that, um, that it doesn't matter so much on, in other countries. It, it's more about it. It's more of a, the real competitive markets like the U S and UK where that makes a big difference uh, or not a big difference, but it does make a difference. Um, as far as I know on foreign language, or other countries, it's not really so much of an issue. Does anybody else have experience with that? You can comment. Um, yeah, I, I second the the fact that it slightly affects your rankings, mm -hmm. but I, I mean it's just another check uh, checkpoint. You know, you you do not need to to move that. I would agree that if you are ranking for the U.S., I mean that would be my main. I mean, if you are ranking for the U.S., there is a high chance that you will be ranking for the other location as well. But then again, the other location would be potentially be much easier to rank. So you could have some quick wins over there and then jump into the US market. You know, that's usually what we recommend. Instead of going all in for the US market, which would be, of course, more difficult to rank, um, you could have some good wins on the foreign market. But yeah, IPs, uh, I wouldn't pay that much of an atten uh, attention to it unless you are, you know, trying to bump your website from position three to position one. You know, at those stages right. when you need to optimize pretty much everything, that's where you want to pay attention to it. And keep in mind that you can always, you can create, like, say, say the root domain is hosted on an IP in the U.S., for example, and you're trying to rank in the U.S. market, and then you want to do a country-specific subdomain for another country. You know, you could set up a hosting account in that other country and then use DNS mapping like Cloudflare or Amazon Route 53 and actually map the subdomain to the IP located in that country, um, to your server or your hosting account located in that country. Guys, you don't have to have, a, you know, you can have subdomains installed on other servers and other hosting accounts in other locations. They don't all have to be on the same host. You just have to map it using a DNS service like Cloudflare or um, Amazon Route 53. So, you know, if you want to get specific about IP location, you can do that. And you don't have to have them all hosted on one host, okay? But like Hernan said, that's that's more of a deal that, you know, if you're trying to get from, uh, you know, move move up that last couple positions and the the competition is kind of fierce, that is something that you might want to do. But for, for most stuff, uh, unless it's, all you know, uber competitive, you're probably not going to make much of a difference. Okay, number two is if I've uploaded a video into a two near a two tier network and after a week is not yet at position one, page one. <laughs> what is the best way to get it at the top spot? Um, well, you know, I wish it was that easy that we could just upload a video to a two tier network and guarantee first page, first position results. But uh, unfortunately, that's not the case, and um, it's pretty rare that that happens actually, unless you're going after a pretty insignificant keyword. So what can you do to get it in the top spot? Would the backlinks package on SERP space be enough? Maybe. I don't know. Um, there's really no way to tell. There's no way to answer this question, Ben. I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm, what I'm trying to say is like there's just so many variables that would have to be looked at to be able to determine a proper plan of uh, attack. 
But um, yes, to probably all of to would backlinks package on SERP space be enough? I don't know. It would be an improvement, but I don't know if it would be enough. So typically, what I like to do, and we've talked about this um, several times, but what I do is always publish the video or upload the video so that it syndicates throughout my network, right? And then I give it about two weeks, and then I go back and see. That's where I like after about two weeks, I check to see where it's settled into the you know where it's settled in the SERPs. And then if it needs a bump, then I will do either a secondary syndication, which can be done with like recipes, the YouTube like recipes, um, or I'll do like a third, like a, you know, a, a third-party tool uh, link blast, like from Sendwire, for example, or I'll send it over to our link building team, and I'll have a you know some links thrown at it that way. There's also social embeds that you can do. For example, guys, you can go and do like a video in a tweet is an embed. So if you tweet the video and then make sure it's an account that a tweet a Twitter account that's not in the sandbox, but if you tweet the video and then you grab the video the tweet URL and then order a retweet gig from a reputable provider, then you can get, you know, 2000 retweets. Well, those are 2000 additional embeds. Tumblr embeds or what they call reblogs. Uh, a Tumblr embed and then reblogging, which is like a retweet, those are also very effective. Pinterest pins and repins are effective. So there's a whole bunch of different, I mean, there's just so many different things that you can do to boost I, it. I would venture to add video powerhouse embed, embeds. Exactly. Yep. Video powerhouse would work as well because that's our embed network and we have uh, first tier embeds and now, well, we have second tier embeds built into the video powerhouse network and now we have. Um, a secondary embed network that we use to also boost it, which are like a bunch of Web2 networks. So, I mean, there's a ton of stuff that you can do. But yes, building links will absolutely help. Where does RYS fit into the picture here? Well, RYS you can use to push um, relevancy to a video. So, like, if you used a, as one of your target URLs, the video URL, uh, in, in an RYS stack or a drive stack, then yes, that will help as well. But again, you know, you can throw the kitchen sink at it, but what I would do is pick a couple of additional methods and apply those first and then give it some time because otherwise sometimes you overkill it, guys, and then your, your results won't um, occur because it was too much too soon or you overkill it and you get the results you want, but you got no room, nothing left in the toolbox for, uh, you know, in case it starts to slip. And so I always, am, you know, we always talk about doing the bare minimum required to rank a property to get your di desired results, right? And so that sometimes it's just an exercise in patience and it's a matter of applying something and then letting it, you know, giving a little bit of time to see what kind of effect it has and then going and applying some more if needed and just repeat that process until you get the desired results, okay? Uh, is it best for getting individual sites or video ranking? Can it, use to, can it be used to juice a network? For RYS, you can, all of the above. Yes, my answer is yes to that. <laughs> it's good for individual sites, for video ranking, for an entire network. I mean, you can do RYS is pretty much good for anything. So, <laughs> um, by the way, first video uploaded to the two tier network I just built hit page one, position nine for the primary search term. Well, there you go. See, that's pretty damn good results for just an upload, guys. Right. So my my guess is uh, Ben, if you uploaded your video to a two tier network, you hit page one, position nine to a brand new network. You're not going to need a whole lot to push it to the top of the page, okay? Because if you're on page one with just an upload to a new network, then you're probably not going to need a whole lot. In fact, if you were to get your networks primed up with some additional content and you use them more often, which will theme the entire network, your the the net the power the authority of that network will increase, and that alone may be enough to push it up. But it's going to take some time and um, some consistent publishing to the network to get it to that point. And then remember, you can also build links to your IFTTT networks to increase uh, the power of those as well, right? It's called boosting the networks. Good questions though, sorry it was in spam, I'm not sure why, probably from the links. All right, next. We've got so many questions to get through and we're already half hour in. Rick says, an SM class series on Browsio would be the best thing in the world, would totally pay for it. The training provided is honestly not as thorough as it could be or as organized. I know you guys would do it right, even if it is just a quick start session at first with more later when you have time. It would be awesome. Please consider. It's in the we works, got some Rick. good news for him. It's in the works. It's in the, it's in the works, Rick. So you want to expand on that, Adam? No, I think that's just the... Okay. 
way to put it. Uh, yeah, it's in the works and hopefully it won't be more than, I mean, it's going to take some time. It's going to be a good in-depth course, but yeah, maybe 60 days. So, yeah, it's going to be good. It's, it, we're, we got the green light. We're, we're, we're going to proceed with it, Rick. So um, just be patient. It's coming. Greg says, hey, guys, going to do my first ever redirection of a three-year-old EMD site to a new URL. I truly don't want to mess it up. Only five pages with backlinks will 301 over, so kind of easy using a redirection plug. And any tips on what to avoid doing and what to be sure to do? Um, not really. I mean, it's only five pages. There's not really a whole lot you can mess up there. Just, you know, keep track of old URLs and new URLs. That's pretty much all you need to do. Um, I always just use a spreadsheet for that. One column for old URLs, one column for new URLs, and match them up. That's it. You can do that... Um, well, you only got five URLs, so you can just do that manually. I was going to say, if you got a whole bunch of pages, you can use the simple 301 redirects, the the bulk uh, extension or add-on, plug-in add-on. It's free, but it'll allow you to upload a spreadsheet with all of your redirects, and it, it's just it saves a lot of time. Okay. Um, there are also some pages I don't want to redirect, but only reuse the content. Should I no index them on the old site or delete those pages entirely? Well, if you're not going to redirect them then what I would do is I would just, if you're going to leave the old site live and you're going to, you want to reuse the content from the old site on the new site, but you don't want a 301 redirect from the old page to the new page, just set canonicals, cross domain canonicals, right? You just go into the old site and add the canonical tag uh, to point to the new page URL. So basically you're telling Google, hey, this page is an exact duplicate of this other page. I want you to give all the credit to this other page, which would be on the new site. Okay, so you canonicalize the new URL, um, you, you know, at, at, to the old page. Does that make sense? You add the new URL to the canonical tag on the old page. All right, left off the question, oops, do I need to keep the content exactly the same on the new site when moving it over? I want to change one page content about 50%, same topic, just written better, thanks. No, you can change it, in fact, I would. Um, and if you're doing a 301 redirect, guys, remember, when you do a 301 redirect, Google doesn't even see the original page anymore because as soon as it sees the redirect in the header, it, it immediately redirects to the next page. It doesn't, like, load the page, scan it, and then redirect. It just sees the redirect code and goes to the next page. So it doesn't matter whether you change the new page or not. Obviously, if you are trying to achieve the same ranking position as what the old page was, then if you're going to edit the new page, then it could cause it to dance. Likely it will dance anyways. But, um, you know, if you're going to improve the page, then you're probably going to end up, once it settles, in a better position than the original page did anyway. Okay? But the same thing goes with canonicals. You can do, you can use it with a canonical. Now, Google tells you uh, that canonicals are supposed to be only used when it is an exact copy of the same page. But I know from testing that the pages can be different and it will still push credit to uh, where you tell it to. Um, I don't know what the threshold is where that stops being effective, but I know that um, changing it, um, I don't know about 50% if I've done it that much, but having, having the pages not be exactly the same um, has worked for me in the past still using canonicals, if that makes sense. Okay. Davis says, I've noticed you guys are posting podcasts on SoundCloud and have a semantic hub there. Do you have any tips and or IFTTT recipes for SoundCloud? Um, no, I do not because I don't do any of the audio stuff. Uh, that's Adam and Hernan. But I know that you can use SoundCloud to um, as a trigger as well. Mm -hmm. So you can actually syndicate those um, embedded MP3 players. Yep. It's just embed code. So you can syndicate, you know, and um, and you can drive juice back to SoundCloud, and SoundCloud is a good semantic hub. So go ahead, Yeah, Renan. Yeah, IFTTT has a, has a native SoundCloud channel. So it will say, you know, every time you upload an episode, every time you you like an episode, et cetera. And um, so it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And I, you know, I have the feeling that we mentioned SoundCloud at some point as a semantic hub on V2 training. If we haven't, we should add yeah. it to maybe the next training because, it, yeah, definitely it's a great semantic hub. And not only that, we are getting a ton of traffic and traction from SoundCloud itself, you know? So um, that that's another, you know, besides being a, a great semantic hub, um, it can be a really 
good traffic generator. You know, if if all you're doing is videos and then ripping the audio and uploading to SoundCloud, if that's all you're doing, it can be really really good for generating traffic as well. Yeah, there's a lot but of traffic on SoundCloud. Pe people have to understand that we walk the walk. We're on Pinterest. We're in Instagram. We use Twitter. We use Facebook. We use anything and everything that we can to drive traffic to our website. We don't rely on just one uh, search engine for traffic. We go, if there's traffic there to, to be mined, we go in there and we try to figure out how to get traffic to our website, which is what you, you all should be doing. Yeah. OK, any, any ninja tips? I'll be setting up a SoundCloud account to host audio files for an email campaign next week, campaign next week, excuse me. And I'm wondering how I can leverage this for SEO as well. Yeah, well, play with it, Davis. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that because, again, I don't do any of the audio stuff. I do all YouTube stuff. So, um, but yeah, just play with it. So I, I know, like I said, you can use the SoundCloud as a trigger. Um, so that's, you, know, it, it, you could potentially set up an entire syndication network s just being triggered by SoundCloud, um, which is pretty cool, right? Because then you can set up, I'm, I'm assuming you could even set up two tiered networks and everything else with that. And it, and it because SoundCloud is such a high authority property, I don't think it could do any harm to it. You know what I mean? So um, I would play with it and just get crazy. Test with it. Let us know your results, by the way. Earl says, I created about two dozen blue chip backlink sites, which had apparently good trust flows and uploaded to S3 on Cloud Boss about four to six months ago. Never got the juice, I hoped. Realized I set many up as non dub dub dub, and then I should have done, or when I should have done the www dot version. So when I went in and started checking on which was what, in process, I realized that many of the two dozen sites now were zero trust flow for all versions. WWW versus non WWW. Okay, so I began process of removing the trust flow zeros from my S3 account, and where the WWW dot had juice, did a switcheroo to the new or to the version with the WWW dot. Okay, so question. Clearly, I was missing something when I bought the domains at twelve dollars, um, roughly. Uh, is it? It's not going to kill me, but about a dozen or s of of so or no longer so I can't be happy okay so I, I, I that's kind of word, worded funny but yes okay so I get it you don't want to waste money on domains I totally understand that I suspect many uh, I suspect many had only one or two backlinks so I was just being too eager and accepting domains I should have passed on possibly Earl so I've talked about this in the past um, what I do when I'm looking for black uh, domains to purchase particularly when I scrape them um, I look at the history. I, I'm not opposed. I'm not saying don't buy a domain that only has one backlink. I'm not saying that because, but what I am saying is you want to check the age of that backlink. So go to the back, the, the linking site when you're, when you're, per, let's say you're, you're looking at a domain and it's only got one referring domain coming to it, but the trust flow numbers are good, right? Um, and which by the way, don't rely so much on the trust flow numbers. You should be looking more for topical relevancy. Okay, don't worry so much about the trust phone numbers. That's just a metric. You want to look more for topical relevancy. That's more important. Okay, so even if the trust phone numbers are low, if it's topically relevant, then it would be a good domain. But let's get back to the, the original question. If you have one referring domain, then what I do is go look at that referring domain and then run that referring domain, that page, specifically that page through archive.org or the Wayback Machine and take a look at snapshots going back and see how long that backlink to the domain that in question, your prospective domain, has been there. If it's been there for five years or six years, then it's absolutely a good domain to purchase because chances are that backlink's never going to be removed, especially if you rebuild the old content onto that domain. So if you rebuild the old site, which you just use the downloader, the um, Wayback Downloader inside of Blue Chip Backlinks to do. Okay. Now, if that backlink's only a year old or a few months old or even a year and a half or two years old, there is a chance that it could be removed. However, again, if you rebuild the old site, chances are it won't be removed. But that doesn't mean that um, things won't happen and the, the, the backlink won't get deleted anyways. All I'm saying is personally, I look, I, I try to find domains that have more than just one referring domain. But if all the other checkboxes for my little checklist of uh, you know criteria to whether I purchase a domain or not if all the boxes are checked except for more than one referring domain but you know then I'll still purchase the domain okay and realize that there is a bit of risk in doing it guys as far as you could be pissing money away on these domains but to me it's an insignificant 
amount when, uh, especially if you go purchase like backlinks from places where you have no control over them. Um, you know, this in my opinion is a better investment because it's 12 bucks plus, you know, nominal hosting fee and you get it for a year, right? So I suspect, uh, wait a minute, Let's see. I know you have gone over guidelines before, but getting hard to find dom dom domains these days. Still, I don't need to pay for junk either. I agree with you, Earl. Um, you'd have to take a look and see what happened. Um, something that you can do, guys, remember you can always go um, look at the backlinks to the, the, the domain that you purchased and actually go throw links at the linking page. So in other words, if you are buy a domain and it has a backlink to it from a particular page on another website, you could always build links to that other website page. Right, it's not even your domain, but it's going to pass through to your domain because there's a link on that page. That's something else that you can do to boost it back up. All right. Also, some of these now trust zero trust flow domains are showing up on some of my money sites with like zero trust flow and eleven citation flow, perhaps from before they lost their juice. Am I hurting my money sites with these, and should I just remove the non-low, the now low, excuse me, trust flow domain, and/or somehow try to rehabilitate it? And for all my true zeros, just click off the auto renew. Yeah, I mean you can if 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 you they lost their metrics and you're not going to invest the time to rebuild the metrics, which I don't particularly like to do either, just set them not to auto renew. In fact, I usually don't set any of the domains that I purchase for backlink uh, for building a private link network, I don't ever set them to auto renew. I'd rather just manually go review them when the renewal period is up you know, when it's time for renewal, go take a look at them and see if they still have value, then I'll renew them. If they don't, then I just let them drop. Okay. Um, as far as removing those, if the topical relevancy was there, Earl, don't remove them, just leave them there. Don't worry about it. Okay. Don't worry so much about that trust flow number. Okay. You're looking for topical relevancy. That's the most important thing. All right. Cliff says, I am building a 30 persona network right now. Cool. I hope he's using Browsio because uh, that could get ugly really fast if you're not. Can they be connected to a different YouTube or blog site uh, or should I create a group of personas per blog or YouTube page I am trying to promote? It seems more natural for the personas to have a varied number of niches they are following and linking to. Thank you. Yeah, I would, Cliff. If you're going to actually build out a 30 persona network and build each one of those personas up, yeah, make them look real. So they're not going to be solely focused on just one topic. That's not natural. Guys, when we automate stuff, we, we certainly um, you know don't want to spend a lot of time going in and uh, manually commenting for each persona and all that kind of stuff. However, I know if you're using Browsio and if you're not, you should be, for especially for what you're attempting to do because there are automated scripts inside of Browsio now, now that will um, mimic real activity for each one of those personas. And so, but yes, to be, to be uh, more realistic, the, each one of those personas should actually have several interests uh, that, you know, so that they look more real, right? I agree with that. Give it some diversity. Now, if it's 100% automated, then that's difficult to do. But if you've got a little bit, if you've got some manual aspect to uh, managing and maintaining those, then then yeah, go through adding in additional um, likes and interests and activity and you know social engagement for each one of those personas. It'll go a long way. In fact, if you go watch our Browsio webinar that we did with uh, Simon da Simon the the developer you'll see like some of the crazy stuff that he's been able to accomplish by building out personas. It's really, really cool. Larry's next. He says, I'm totally new and going through the course. I'm assuming he's talking about IFTTT SEO Academy and Evernote since it doesn't tell me to publish once I create a name for the notebook in Notebook Info. Uh, it is, is it now automatically in publish mode or am I missing something? Because of this, I didn't receive or seem to have a public notebook URL. When checking the note I created, I need to sign in to see it. There should be, Larry, unless something has changed, um, there, should, there should be an ability to create a link, a share link. And um, the interface may have changed. That happens. And we need people like you to alert us of that. Um, so I appreciate that. We'll take a look at it. I'm going to put it on my, I'm writing it down. Just give me a minute. Evernote share URL. To see if, uh, and we'll, we'll cover this in the next update webinar, which is going to be in about, it might be next week. Oh, no, no, it won't be next week. It'll be probably in two weeks from today will be the next IFTTT update webinar. 
we got several properties we're going to be covering in there, guys. If you guys thought the last update webinar was good, which it was, this next one's going to be really good as well. So we'll cover that, Larry. I'm not 100% sure because I, I haven't seen what you're talking about, um, but there should be a way to create a share URL which makes it public. Um, if you and again, I've, I've written it down. I'll take a look at that, and we'll uh, we'll address that in the next update webinar if something has changed. Okay. Jay says I'm tinkering with my own recipe, but is it doomed for failure? I have a Google alert going to Gmail inbox with a recipe that pushes the G alert content to an Evernote notebook. These G alert posts in the Evernote note display as many experts, not the full posts, and one after the other in the same note. It makes for a messy but highly relevant doc. They have no links or attribution back to the G alert sources. Not sure how I could do that. I did code every G alert post to link to another note in the same notebook. This note has links to a GMAP G site and host that map. Jay's killing it, guys. <laughs> you reading this? <laughs> That's awesome. I have yeah, a yeah. He's killing it. <laughs> That's what we like to see, Jay. Get out there and experiment. Um, that's pretty cool what you're doing. Um, I'd like to know more about that, or at least what your results are. Uh, he says, I have a rank feeder feed or two doing its thang to the notebook. Are these G alert posts in the Evernote notebook going to be dupe content or simply a waste of time? No, they won't be dupe content. Um, simply a waste of time. I doubt it. It's probably doing something, but there's no way to tell without testing and tracking results. But it sounds interesting. What it, what, when are you guys going to comment? Yeah, I was just going to say if he's in the V2 group, the IFTTT SEO Academy V2, that sounds like a uh, prime candidate for uh, posting up a case study and maybe uh, winning something. <laughs> yeah, winning something, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, was, I, I was just thinking that, that if he just wants to create attribution, he can code it into the recipes. Yeah, but I think what he's talking about is the G-Alert is going to produce multiple sources. You, you know okay. what I'm saying? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so who would you attribute it to? You can only attribute to one source, really. You know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, no, again, Jay, I think it's pretty cool that, guys, we encourage you to test. You know, we encourage you to test. We give you a template that works well because um, it's been tested, tried and true type thing. But we absolutely encourage you guys to test. So, uh, Jay, I don't think it's going to cause any issues at all. It might be, I mean, at the very worst, it will just be ineffective. But there's uh, probably a chance it's going to do something, and I'd like to know what it is. So, again, if you're in the IFTTT SEO group, um, yeah, that's certainly a candidate for a case study. It doesn't have to be real in-depth, but if you do make one, then we, uh, you know, we, we reward people that share in the group. So, Daryl, he says, I built a site for a customer and got paid, and then they started paying for monthly SEO. $200, okay. Site indexed in Bing and Yahoo, but refuses to index in Google. No manual spam messages in console. URL has been submitted, sitemap submitted, search engines indexing switch in WordPress is okay. Uh, search engine indexing switch in WordPress is okay. Competition links are very low. I've run bookmarks, paid niche directory entry, blog spot article with link in, in it is indexed. I have tweeted URL and tweet with URL is indexed. Wow. Also YouTube channel with link in description and in channel index center. Okay, so essentially, long story short, uh, it's been two months since go live date. Client refuses any SEO that involves a site with a review element, e.g. Google Maps, et cetera, Facebook, basically anything that would be first steps in strategy. He stopped paying monthly a month ago. He said he will sue me for site build costs, refund a site not fit for purpose, is not indexed in G. Advice to get this indexed. Ooh, Daryl, that sucks, man. Sounds like you got a First things first, though, I would say, I, yeah, that's true, what Bradley's saying, but uh, I know Hernan's told me a story about this, but have you checked, like, the robots? The robots.txt file, that's what I was going to say. I made sure that it had to index because, man, that's like the have you tried turning it off and on again because, man, there's some stories of some, you know, a plug-in <laughs> causing a conflict. Her not told me one. I know. I hear him laughing. <laughs> yeah, I had a client once that um, he was, he, he, he had just, well, it was funny because his ex designed his website, you know, <laughs> and he, and she left that box that, uh, you know, that discouraged search engines to index this website on WordPress ticked and the guy wasn't, you know, getting indexed. So it was pretty, pretty fun. Yeah. So I yeah, would say I check out things. Hopefully it's not that, but look into the easy stuff first. Yeah. And check the robots.txt file. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marco. And Daryl, I, I see Daryl a lot with us. So reach out to me privately, Daryl, and I'm going to show you a super ninja way to get that sucker index, man, just because. Okay. I just Here's decided the other thing I was going to mention. You win. Yeah. First thing I would mention is $200 for SEO work, um, not enough, number one. 
So uh, I know you're in a situation, you're in a bit of a pickle now, Daryl. Um, I get that, but $200 is enough for SEO work. It's not, I mean, $200 is not enough for SEO work, number one. Number two, um, you know, the client, he's going to be a pain in the ass. Um, I, I mean, I, I get it. He's probably pissed, but one of the things is try to force the index, reach out to Marco. He said he'd give you some, um, you know, cons cons he'll consult with you on that, which is really cool of him. Um, but I know I've had issues where I've had it, uh, domains that just won't index, and we've, we've talked about um, Terry Kyle. He calls it the random ranking factor. Sometimes domains just are arbitrarily, um, like, flagged by Google. They won't even show anything in the search console but they just won't perform well or not index. And sometimes you just need to swap out the domain. So, and I know it's for clients, a lot of clients are gonna be pain in the ass about it and they'll just refuse to accept that. But you know, that's sometimes that's what you have to do. But there might be some other ways. Um, Marco, if he has something super ninja that he's gonna share with you, then I'd take him up on that. Yeah, if, if it doesn't index this way, then there is no way to index it. I guarantee it. Yep. And then hey, it would be, and okay. what I would do, I, I would clone the site and put it on a different uh, domain and see if it indexes. I would do that without even asking the client. I would just clone the site, put it on a different domain, and see if it indexes because that could just be a, it could just be a domain issue. But go ahead, Adam. Um, yeah, once are, are you done with this question? Yes. Okay, cool. So I just wanted to bring this up. Uh, Carol, <clears throat> excuse me, Carol up at the very top, if you scroll up, she answered Larry's question, which was before on Evernote. So uh, if you want to uh, show that real quick so that. Uh, you have to click to modify sharing and then publish. The notebook won't show up until it's published. Took me a while to figure that out. Carol, that's awesome. You're in the mastermind. Let us know. Um, if you don't mind, Carol, uh, if you could, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to do work for us, but if you have like a very short procedure for what you had to do, just a linear step by step. It doesn't have to be real, uh, just you know, super descriptive. Um, that would be really helpful, Carol. And I will make sure that I give you credit for that in uh, the update webinar. And we can link to one of your sites for you if you want or something. <laughs> Drive some traffic to you. Um, then we're about out of time, guys. I, we've got so many questions. It just sucks. We got. <laughs> I mean, it's great to have this many questions. Don't get me wrong. It sucks that we can't uh, answer them all today. Ben says, hi guys, I was just wondering, can we get an address without using virtual office because the location I want to do, lead gen does, doesn't contain any virtual offices for me to use? Uh, also, can the same address be used for multiple different kinds of businesses? Okay, so first question, um, I don't know where you're located, Ben, but if you're located in the U.S., just use a P.O. box from the United States Postal Service, okay? If you're in the, it, because you might not have any virtual offices, but I guarantee uh, that you got a post office somewhere close by, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because um, doesn't every town in America have a, P a post office? Um, I, or, you know, I think they do anyways. Uh, I, I can't, I don't know exactly where you are, but I would just use a PO box. That's what I do. Okay, number one. Also, can the same address be used for different kinds of businesses? It can then, but it can get a bit sticky. Um, you can, however, this is the thing. If you're going to register a PO box, then the PO box, you have to list the business name on there. So I don't know how accepting they will be of multiple business names for the same PO box. Uh, the, the post office itself might say, no, that's not acceptable. I don't try, I haven't tried that because I always just get multiple PO boxes from the same post office. If I'm going to create multiple lead gen sites, because I want the unique address, um, which is just a unique box number really, but I want that. And I'm not, I, I don't mind paying for it because post office boxes are so cheap. Like the most expensive one cost me about 168 bucks per year. The cheapest one's about $64 per year. So to me, it's a very nominal cost to just go ahead and have separate PO boxes. However, years ago when I first started using this strategy, I, before using post office boxes, it was before that was an option. Um, I used to use UPS boxes, uh, you know, the UPS store mailboxes. And um, I would just go talk to the owner and say, listen, I'm going to register this mailbox, but I'm going to have different business mail coming in and it's just going to say box. Let's say my box number was 101. I'd say box 101A, then 101B, then 101C. And I would just make sure the manager knew that so that they would deliver all that mail correctly to my box. Even though they might not have, you know, it was just box 101, I would tell them, well, business A is going to be box 101A. The business two is going to be box 101B, and that, that used to work, okay? 
but you also want to make sure that if you're going to use the same address, if, if you can uniquify it some way, that's how you want to do it, but you absolutely have to use unique business names and unique phone numbers and unique web addresses if that's the case. You can share one data point in the NAP, but you have to have all the other data points completely unique. All right. All right, we're gonna ask. I'm gonna answer Greg's and uh, and Rosanna's, and we're gonna end it, guys. I know we're supposed to end right now, but I want to Rosanna. I think this is Rosanna Rowe from inside the IFTTT Academy. I'll answer that one in just a moment. Greg says built a silo from an existing site that already ranked good metrics. We did 301 from old page names, all indexed correctly and flowing according to Google Index and Webmaster Tools. Problem with main website keyword is ranking on another page and not main website page. Interlinking is spot on. Any more benefit to have old pages in place? but use canonical or stick with 301s. Any other quick suggestions you can think of for this issue? Greg, um, one of our, I, I, I haven't done any testing on this in quite some time, but one of our mastermind members, Greg, uh, I, I, I don't want to butcher his last name. Does anybody know how to pronounce his last name properly? Nedgedly. Uh, Nedgedly, Nedgedly. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to butcher your name, Greg, but he's done a lot of testing on canonicals, um, and he's shared inside of our mastermind some experiences that he's had with forcing the correct page to rank for the correct keywords using canonicals. Something I've done many months ago, but I haven't test. I haven't haven't done a lot of it recently. I know he's in the mastermind, and you are not, but you could probably reach out to him and ask him if he wouldn't mind sharing. Uh, hopefully, he didn't throw you under the bus, Greg. <laughs> but um, I, I would I would seriously reach out to him and ask what he did or if he wouldn't mind sharing because I know he's been successful in doing exactly what you're asking about. You guys want to comment on that at all before we move to the last question? No, I think that 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 that's a good answer. Um I'm just trying to think of another member also on the mastermind, but yeah, I think Greg uh excels in that particular yeah. in the canonical stuff. All right, last one and I really feel bad because Rico Suave said he wanted to put his uh question in here before the hump day hangout number 100 <laughs> we're gonna run out of time guys Rosanna says hey guys I've been watching your videos and got many great products from you such as IFTTT and content kingpin one of the videos Bradley mentions to use expired domains with good metrics and rebuild the sites with archive.org website files then make all the external links no follow add only one or two do follow links to each site I try to host these sites across different hosting providers but I'm wondering if I still still leave footprints since only money site URLs are do follow um, yeah you can if you do it excessively Rosanna if you're just hand, you know, a handful of links that from from rebuilt sites with all the uh, URLs no follow except for the do follow link to your site, then you know that if you're just doing it occasionally a few, then I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about it so much. Um, if you start to see any negative effect, then you can always go in and remove it, remove because you have control over those do domains. But one of the things that you can do to completely avoid that altogether is use buffer sites. You know, use buffer sites, link from from those rebuilt sites uh, to or IFTTT properties, or to Semantic Hub properties, or to citations, or whatever. My point is, is just use uh, buffer sites so that you're not linking directly to your site if you're worried about it. Okay. Um, she also says, and since I no longer have blue chip backlink subscription, I manually replaced AH with ref with A. It's supposed to be rel equals no follow, but yes, that's fine. That's the same thing. A no follow, that's all that is, is adding the no follow tag to the link. Rel equals quote no follow end quote. Okay. All right, guys, should I answer Rico's or should we end it? Well, we got two minutes. Let's do it. And um, real quick before you go, I want to say to everybody, because I see there's Cody. Um, Jeremy and a couple other people. Uh, if you guys go to semanticmastery.com slash hump day, um, that's how you can get here. We generally have that up within 24 hours of this ending. So um, if not by 48 hours, we definitely do. So, you know, today, if you didn't get your questions answered or it happens in the future, just, you know, try to get in there. It's first come, first serve. Yeah. Um, also, Brian Dunn, I posted your question from inside the mastermind here. Unfortunately, um, we're not going to have time to get to it today, but I will um, I will answer that in the mastermind for you then because I told you I was going to answer it here today, but just didn't get to it. So I apologize. I will get to it in the mastermind for you, okay? Uh, Rico's question is, hi, guys. My goal was to post a question on time before Hump Day Hangouts 100 since I am always too late. So that's why we're answering it. Mixed rank my shit uh, or rank your shit, I guess. G maps IFTTT question. If I understand it correctly, when you create a custom map and add some relevancy stacking in it, you have a custom map URL iframe that you can syndicate from main 
to all IFTTT properties. I have included coded uh, or some markup in it as well. I want to add additional extra relevancy later after it has been syndicated, but this shouldn't be a problem since the custom map iframe stays the same even if I add additional markers from other cities in this regional custom map. Is this correct? Thanks. Yeah, because once you've embedded the code everywhere, you can still go in and edit the original map. Right? So you can add additional data or remove data. You can add new links, add new uh, maps, pins, add new layers. There's all kinds of stuff you can do. doesn't matter. Yeah. Not, you, you don't have to change the maps on our, every location. You only have to change it in one location. Yeah, but I think he's talking specifically about some stuff that I, that I revealed when we were doing the iframe webinars. Okay. And the answer is yes, you can do that. And, and it, it won't it, because you, you're not uh, changing the code. So you're fine. Okay. And also that, uh, you know, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of that, that would be a question reserved for the RYS group. Um, not so much on a public hump day hangout. Just, and I'm not saying anything bad to you, Rico. I'm just saying, like, we can't get into the details of the RYS stacking stuff here because that is a, you know, pretty valuable secret training stuff. So to answer Marco's remark on my lead gen side, is your plan to dominate a complete niche? Yeah, Marco. I need the money to invest in more training from SM. <laughs> so plus one that. All right, guys. Unfortunately, we didn't get to the rest of the questions, but there were some great questions today. We appreciate that. We will see everybody next week for uh, Hump Day Hangouts episode 100. Woo! Awesome. Maybe we'll give something next away next week. You want to? Random? Like a birthday cake. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure something out. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll come with the hats. So the moral of the story is, uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours, when the new Hump Day Hangouts event page is up, Post some questions, guys, because maybe we'll pick at random somebody next week to give something valuable away to for our 100th episode. Mm, oh, sorry. I should have done that. Mm, yes. <laughs> all right, guys. We'll see you all next week. Thanks for being here. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, Bye, everyone.